Ibu. Thanks, Rachel, very much. So we do acknowledge and thank the National Forum for their support for this session, at the end of which we hope we will all be able to understand key issues and debates in digital professionalism, in the professional education, and apply concepts of digital professionalism to our own teaching, learning, and scholarly activities. If we move to the next slide, I want to introduce uh, Rachel from a somewhat different perspective. I joined academia 10 years ago, and in 2010, my first conference as an academic was Amy in Glasgow. And the pre-conference symposium was on digital professionalism. At that stage, you can see Rachel was actually still in Ontario. And what I want to draw uh, attention to is that LOA and colleagues uh, publication of 2015, which Rachel does um, address many of the, the contents in it during her session today, has a quote, digital professionalism is an emerging discourse. From Rachel's perspective, that's been an emerging discourse for decades. It's not new to her. She has a wealth of experience. And back there in 2010, she absolutely inspired me before I ever became involved in the notion of blended learning and the potential within that to be both professional and a professional educator. So with that said, and to maximize our time, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Rachel Elloway for our session, Digital Professionalism for All Those Who Teach. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Cicely. That's wonderful. And uh, hello from Calgary. I know it's your mid afternoon, but it's actually my early morning here. And uh, if I'm not sure if you can see me on the camera, but uh, if I look a bit dark, it's because the sun hasn't even properly come up yet. So bear with me in that regard as well. So I'm here today to talk about digital professionalism. Um, and it's a topic I've been interested in for a number of years. Um, and it's something that I hope I can get your interest in and can share some ideas about how this can be woven into your life, both in terms of your practice and your teaching. Um, before I do anything else, however, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, that comprises the Siksika, Bikani, Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearsport and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I should also mention I do have a small conflict of interest to disclose, which is that I am the editor in chief of the, the journal Advances in Health Sciences Education, which I get a small stipend from Springer Nature. But apart from that, I don't think I have any other um, conflicts of interest to declare. And if you detect any in the process, then you should draw my attention to them because digital professionalism is all this is about. So how, where should we start? Well, let, I think the clear place to start is to think about this being a digital world. Yeah, so much of what we do is mediated and remediated by digital technologies. I mean, my lifetime in, in, indeed within the last 20 years, you know, I, pretty much everything I do, like travel arrangements, banking, shopping, so many things are now conducted online, something which we I don't think we were even thinking about 20 years ago. Um, and certainly, uh, given the, the uh, exigencies of COVID over um, the last wee while, that we've seen that a lot of things in education and healthcare have also been moved online. Um, some of this is about doing the same things we've done before, but in a digital format. Some of them is about doing brand new things. Social media, people being prepared to share so much of their lives, um, people engaging in podcasts, this sort of democratization of what's called citizen content. So many people creating things and sharing them online. And it's even got to the stage where the United Nations have been for some time thinking about connectivity, like drinking water and peace and justice, um, becoming a basic human right. The digital is everywhere in our world. But this is much more than just being able to say, well, we were doing this thing uh, offline and now we're doing it online. Um, and particularly in the context of health professions education, we are seeing a lot of changes that are coming into this space. 
they might well say, well, why is the duck there? The duck's there is because essentially, although when a flood comes, it may distress a lot of the land-born animals, ducks used to float here and now they just float here. Um, for instance, in the health professions education, we're seeing an increasing democratization of information. At one time, if you wanted to learn to be a nurse or a physician or a pharmacist, you had to go to a school to do that. And that was the, not only was that the only way to get the qualification, but that was the only way that you get the information. Now, most of in fact, a significant amount of um, medical clinical knowledge is, is available to anybody and everybody online. Not only that, but are the, the health professions learners are drawing on this 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 sense of this distributed um, information. They're not just relying on the school to provide the information and resources they have engaged in as part of their training. We are seeing a world that is very much influenced by Twitter. Certainly, you've been watching the uh, what's been happening in the United States for the last four years. Twitter has played a significant role in that, and Facebook and other technologies have made a significant role as well. Um, I, I just think about uh, the way that uh, students take images of each other and uh, paste, uh, post images and posts on their Facebook pages and document a lot of their student lives, which previously was just not really known or available to anybody except those who are directly involved. May even get to the point where we're starting to think about um, content anarchy. You know, there is the the, the the deep concern over the use of things like uh, Wikipedia, and there have been major debates going backwards and forwards about well, is it unprofessional to use it, Wikipedia, or is it now actually the the only reliable, up to date source we can go on to? Well, I mean, there's there's no one right answer to that, but the fact that we are concerned about what is truth. Um, and, and where can we get the best reliable resources is critical. And this takes us on to this idea of fake news, um, the, the way that uh, waves of paranoia and misinformation have been spreading around the world and misrepresenting and changing you know, the, the, and challenging you know, the, the basic uh, claims of science and uh, truth to be able to speak to things like uh, health education. And all of this has created significant challenges to the professions, to expertise and to science as a whole. And we've also seen a, a, an increasing shift towards um, online healthcare. Um, certainly, it, it, a lot of it's digitally mediated. We, we use online learning environments, we use online tools, we have things being pushed to our mobile phones and so on. In healthcare, we're seeing the growth of e-health, the use of electronic health records and electronic medical records. We're seeing them shift towards virtual care, telehealth, and of course, online learning. The big pivot we saw with COVID in the spring it was a major reflection of that. Now, a lot of training will focus on what we call operator skills. How do I use the technology? But that really is the basic minimum. The, the, the bigger challenge and the bigger responsibility is to stay professional in these new and emerging environments. And so the critical then think is then how do we think about uh, the role of professionalism? How do we think about the, ro the role of the professional in a world that has so many digital dimensions to it? And how has professionalism changed and challenged in an environment where there are so many media through which those forms of professionalism might be uh, expressed or may, may well be challenged to come up with appropriate responses? And that really begs the question about how do we prepare, prepare health professionals, um, both those who are in practice and those in training, to be able to maintain their professionalism, to maybe hopefully extend or improve their professionalism in this multifaceted world. Well, a critical part of that is to be able to understand the spaces in which we function. And we can start off by thinking about uh, dimensions. Though when I'm looking at these two dimensions, one is defined between the, the difference between things being public and private, and those between being personal and professional. And in looking at that, we can map into this space a whole range of different kinds of activity. Some of you will be more active in some of these quadrants than others, but essentially down in the personal private space, that's the things that, that you do that are online that are just for you. And you don't really want the world being able to see them. I am not going to log into my bank account during this session. Um, I don't think I have anything to shame about, be ashamed about, but at the same time, I don't really want to share that. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna show you pictures of my garden or my pets or my family. That's done in the personal private space. The professional private space is basically the things that you do within the precincts of care. It's within the circle of care. And so that will be things like accessing electronic health records, engaging in electronic referrals, 
all the ELE health activities, which are professional, but are really just kept within, within the interactions with individual patients or with other colleagues. Above the line, into the public sphere then, in the personal space, you can think about things like your, your expression of politics political or your opinions, you know, what you think about the Kardashians or, you know, gay burn or anything else at all, things that happen that are really about you, they don't really interact with the professional sphere. In the public professional space are those acts which are about you still being a professional, but engaging a broader population, such as public health information, at, uh, works of advocacy and so on. And so it's very easy to see, well, actually, even in this simplified model, there are very different rules, different expectations and different sets of responsibilities in these different areas. So let me ask a question and, and I'll immediately answer it. Um, are you always a professional despite whichever medium you're working through? And the answer is, well, yes, of course you are. Um, Professionalism, however you're doing it, is still professionalism. Professionalism using sock puppets is still professionalism. And digital professionalism is a part of the professionalism agenda. But I would point out that the social contract, which really defines what professionalism is, that's the relationship between a profession and society that defines the expectations each has of the other, to some extent is changing in the face of these digital media. And yet like, we can anchor this in the, the general principles of professionalism. This is from the ACGME in the United States, but the principles are pretty much the same everywhere. Um, that this is about behaving as a good person, being accountable, uh, showing compassion, uh, committing to the highest standards you can and maintaining those ethical principles and responsiveness at all times. And I'm not gonna go through those in depth. I hope that they, they map to your own experiences of what professionalism means. This is how myself and my colleagues define digital professionalism. Um, and it's about any use of digital media. Uh, and that includes laptops and cameras and uh, the use of uh, mobile phones and iPads and so on. But it's also the, the things like uh, the use of memory sticks. It's also about things such as the way that you use social media and so on. And it has to be based on principles of proficiency reputation and responsibility. Proficiency in the sense of you need to be able to do it and do it um, to a, an acceptable standard. Reputation because you need to ensure that the integrity, the trustworthiness and the accountability is there. And the responsibility because you will one way or another be held accountable for the acts that you engage in in digital media. So you better be sure that they are of a high professional standard. So let me let's do one of those quick pauses and I'll stop just for a a couple of minutes and, and I'd, I'd like to put this back out to you particularly those of you who don't come from medicine which by the sound of it is most of you what does digital professionalism mean to you in your teaching and your activities I'm going to flip to the chat so I can see if there are any chats coming up and at the same time if you have any uh, verbal comments go ahead Kieran do you want to come in there no I I, no. I just moved and brought up my screen <laughs> okay. but, uh, Sorry, I'm not entirely sure chat has been enabled. Um, yeah, I don't have a chat button there. It's up at the top right hand screen yeah, uh, no, beside participants. No. no, it's not there. No, we have raise your hand or more actions and it's not under more actions. Oh. OK, well, anybody want to come in on the mic? Any questions for Rachel? Or should I just keep going? Just one comment here, that Geraldine. Gray. For me, you know, when you're online, you're a little disconnected from the person at the other end. So in terms of t teaching world, it's a, I think in no matter what medium you're communicating, you still have to remember the human being at the other side and make sure you're making that kind of human connection. That's so easy to do face to face. Absolutely. Great comment. Thank you. I could could also say that I, I find it a challenge that in a lecture theatre with a group of people, you can occasionally say something lighthearted. Um, but it's more difficult to do that uh, in an environment where it's definitely recorded and you're kind of asking yourself, how is this going to sound later on out, out of context and so on? So it makes it more difficult to build rapport. 
Absolutely. I can, as a reflection of that, um, I, I don't know, I don't know whether the Irish are very sweary, but I can tell you the Scots are. And so when I moved from Edinburgh to Canada, I was a bit surprised exactly how not sweary the Canadians are and how much I had to really be mindful of about turning down that lighthearted, flippant, so at times that, that flow that uh, you have that I was used to in one context so that it was socially acceptable in another. Any other last thoughts? Yeah, the only other thing that comes to mind, it may not be really directly related to this, but just imparting that idea of digital professionalism to your students, both to protect you and them. So at the start of a lecture, we, we've developed a kind of a little video that reminds them about, like what you said at the start, that this is being recorded in particular, not to share for talking about any case scenarios, anything that could identify a pace, patient from a, a medical scenario in particular, but also you know, for them to be aware of, of I, I suppose in some ways they're a lot more aware of it than we are, but um, in other ways they they socialize so much on digital platforms that just to be aware that this isn't the same for them, that they need to draw a line that in a professional context of a lecture, you, you can't say anything. Um, there, there needs to be an element of professionalism there. Absolutely. It's one of the challenges of digital media is that it often seems that the young have a greater grasp of this than we do. And that's, you know, you can think about the other whole thing about, you know, kids being able to change, you know, program the VCR, although that incredibly dates me now. Um, but what we really see is that younger people often have a lot of confidence, but they often don't have much more competence than we do. Whereas we tend to lack confidence because it all seems new. And so, you know, being able to sort of cross that gap of, all the young seem to be in control of this to the point where no well, we will still set, you know, collectively set those those levels those standards so the work is a critical part of that so thank you for that so let me keep going um so why do we worry about digital professionalism well a lot of it comes down to what we call the social contract and the premise the premise of the social contract is that the professions are afforded a degree of autonomy uh, authority and prestige um, as long as we do have a higher set of standards and maintain them and police them than those that are required of us. So society will say you need to do these following things. You need to be you need to be uh, trustworthy. You need to be able to be reliable. You need to be uh, accountable. You need to be compassionate or whatever the criteria are. We will do that. But then the profession then says, well, OK, we'll do that and we'll we'll go further. We'll actually hold to a higher standard so that we maintain that sense of trust, that sense of responsibility and the ability to meaningfully provide services to the society that with, the, with whom we have that social contract. Now, the key thing about the social contract is. It's not just as in it's, it's a sort of broad sense of the relationships between a profession and society, but it's something that can be broken and it can be broken significantly if that trust is lost. And I would point, for instance, the Harold Shipman case in the United Kingdom or some of the other misdemeanors that were happening at that point. And certainly, you know, think about the uh, the retraction of some of the research, early research around COVID, around uh, chloroquine um, from I think it was the Lancet and. Uh, was it the New England Journal? Anyway, whichever journals it was, there are times when if individuals can actually lose the trust of those they're serving. So clearly the social contract can be broken. And unfortunately, digital technology, as much as it's wonderful, it's allowing us to communicate and share the session today, it does create, does enable many ways in which the social contract might be stretched, cracked or even completely broken. So in what way does that happen? Well, that's because technologies can do lots of different things. First thing they can do is accelerate its speed of action and response. Um, we, they, we can interact instantaneously, as hopefully we are on this, this, this webinar. Um, but also think about it also changes expectations. It used to be that students would be say, well, you know, I'll, I'll have my office hours you know, Monday and Tuesday between these hours and come and see me. Now it's they can basically email or message their tutors um, pretty much 24 7 365 and they have this sense of well they haven't got back to me in the last 10 minutes what's wrong oh my god I'm in trouble and so it not only does it increase our ability to respond and interact quickly but also it changes our expectations around that it defeats limits of geography and time. Here I am in Calgary speaking to you in Ireland and I'm right by the Rocky Mountains 
and I can hear a big Canadian Pacific train going by outside and yet we're interacting and in the meantime you're in I, I think I heard Cork and Dublin and various other places you know you're, we're all interacting this is an amazing thing that we can do it allows us to provide exponential connectivity not only are we talking at this great distance from each other but we're all connecting and we're all paying information you may well have be having social media or twitter back channels in this very action there are lots of ways that we can have this connectivity in ways that just expand and expand all the time this also tends to blur social conventions you know some of the the, the comments just now were kind of moving in this direction in the sense of there are there is uh, there is a sense that you, there are things you will say face to face to somebody or the way they interact, which are probably relatively formal and quite polite, that are not observed in digital media. Certainly, uh, we often see students or colleagues interact with each other in ways that seem more abrupt, more terse, less respectful, even if whether that whether or not that was actually intended um, than the ways they would necessarily interact face to face. We can track everything. Uh, Cecily said at the top of this, and Cecily and Jay said at the top of this, that this uh, webinar is being recorded. Pretty much everything you do online can and probably is being recorded. And not only that, though we can model behaviors. Uh, it's very likely that you've used a, a search engine called Google at some point. In fact, who doesn't use Google? The thing about Google is you may have noticed that the, your search results are actually improving over time the reason for that is because they are profiling you google probably knows more about you than you know about yourself and so that tracking is useful in some regards but also has the potential to use for other purposes which are probably less desirable and this happens at an incredibly large scale um, and there are various organizations like the National Library of Medicine, no, sorry, uh, National Library in the United States and a few others, National Archives in the United States and others, who try to, in, try to archive the Internet. And in doing so, they have to have a vast amount of information capacity to be able to do that. And really, this massification of data has also been extremely challenging and why we're taking these kinds of things forward. And in this context, then, it's very easy to misstep. We might exchange information and thoughts intentionally in the sense of, well, I think it's OK to give you this this information. Um, we might have a student who, who's got their mobile phone and takes a photograph of their patient's rash and then emails it to a friend. Well, because they didn't realize that although they intended to send this picture, they're actually they're still they're breaking patient confidentiality. We may exchange information and thoughts unintentionally. I, I, I've done it. Many of you may have done it is inadvertently send it send my email to the wrong Rachel or I've um, I, I didn't BCC blind co carbon copy people or in some way another way I've sent information that I didn't mean to other people or it's like I, you know, I left a memory stick that's got you know the, the launch codes to you know the nuclear arsenal on the bus those kind of things the sharing of images and videos is got is become really really easy 20 years ago, if you took a picture, you'd have to take it to the, the chemist to get it developed and you come back with some actual prints. Now you can just stick it, take it on your mobile phone and have it um, being shared and, you know, and tweeted by millions of people within seconds. Um, likewise, videos. There are many opportunities for security breaches, whether, again, they're intended or not. And there are some major concerns about what the, the consequences of that. In fact, we're hearing you know, almost week by week that some major platform has been compromised and now we have to change all our passwords again. There may be unintended associations with others. That So, for instance, on Facebook, somebody might follow you and that somebody who's following you may be somebody you don't really want to have follow you. And depending on the way that you set Facebook up or whatever other platform you're using, it may still look like now you're associated with this right wing uh, racist group or with this uh, uh, motorcycle gang or something else. And there are many, many ways in which your remarks can be misinterpreted, certainly if they are taken out of context or misrepresented. And so in all these ways, and there are many more, that their digital professionalism can actually become quite important because it can be very easy to step over the line into being unprofessional. We should also be aware that this scrutiny is ambient. You should always assume that anything you do online will be online forever. Anything you post you will never always be able to take it down. And certainly anything you put into the public domain, it's very likely you'll never be able to take it down. And that's your photographs, any comments or any associations with other individuals or organizations. 
And as an ex- as example of this, I don't know how what this looks like in Ireland, and maybe you have a very different culture in this respect. But what we're seeing increasingly in uh, academe and in medicine um, is that when people take photographs of social groups, so the, group of profs or group of doctors get together it used to be that everybody would be you know raising a wine glass and cheering and looking very happy now as soon as the camera comes out all the wine glasses bottles um, gin and tonics and everything else gets swept under the table and so it looks all that everybody's doing is drinking water or orange juice because there is this sense of well if i'm holding a wine glass am i now going to be seen as a raging alcoholic now, that's a fairly extreme response, but we are starting to see that that, that near paranoia, that, that, that concern that the way that uh, an image may be interpreted may cast me in a bad light. Certainly, our HR departments and others are scouring social media in the sense of highs. If you don't think they are, trust me, they are. So if you've got something on Facebook that sets you in bad light, you're not likely to get the job you might want to get. And I can tell you that the media, print media and other media are scouring social media all the time to see what people are saying. Having said that, you know, so that's a fairly bleak, scary environment that looks like, well, I'm not going to touch a computer again in my entire life. I'm done with that. Well, no, not really because you can use it in very positive ways as well. You can certainly use social media to do it cautiously and judiciously to extend compassion and care. And certainly I've seen examples of both healthcare providers and students doing that. You can use social media as for advocacy and leadership. Certainly in North America, we've been seeing the way that um, healthcare providers have been uh, pushing back against the campaigns to uh, to end restrictions, to not wear face masks, and saying, actually, no, it saves lives. Please do this. Um, we're seeing that you can use uh, digital media to access populations and engage in discussions that you might not otherwise be able to have. So the advocacy side can be very strong in that regard. And certainly, really, you can engage in an online environment because anybody you need it can have that presence and you can reach out to them. And certainly with the COVID emergency, we're, we're seeing much more use of digital media in really everything that we do. So let me just take another one of these little pauses and just, just you know, put back to you. Um, has anybody had an experience, either positive or negative, in the ways that uh, digital technologies and particularly digital professionalism has uh, impacted education? And what might have you have learned from that? Perhaps if people would just give their name and discipline when they're asking questions or making comments. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'll give you an example whilst you're thinking. Um, our, it used to be that um, healthcare professional students, particularly medical students, who had a bit of a reputation as sort of a rather party heavy crowd used to do various things that often involved traffic cones ending up on top of various statues and other structures. The 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 um, the fun and games that sort of that, that sort of student misbehaviour is pretty much a thing of the past now because almost everybody's carrying a phone and people take photographs in you know in bars or carrying around traffic cones to put on top of things. And it now, in seconds, the people who've done these things are known potentially to the world. And so there is this sense that um, the, the catharsis from the, at times, social excesses of uh, student life are pretty much now abandoned. And you have to be very mindful and very careful exactly who's got a camera and whether you whether you a camera's pointing to you. And mostly you just have to assume that that is always possible. You are always online. Any other thoughts before I move forward? Encourage anyone to come in there. Hi there, this is Derek Sullivan uh, from the Dental School in Trinity. Hi Derek. And I guess just it's a trivial uh, um, thing, I guess, but a positive aspect of digital, digital technology is celebrating um, major landmarks, for instance, graduation ceremonies at the end of courses. And it's great for schools to be able to post things like that. But there's always the concern about do you need permission from each of the if you've got a lineup of a full class, do you have do you have to get permission from each of those class members before you could post that, for instance, say on a hospital or a school Facebook page? Absolutely. And as a reflection, I mean, think about um, I know 20 years ago, 
when you'd go to a primary school event, you know, they're having a play or something, and you'd have all the dads with their, their video cameras recording it for posterity. And now you don't see that at all because you really shouldn't be taking videos or photographs of young kids at all. And so these changes um, and the understanding of the implication of those changes have in short time moved us on and changed the thinking and changed the value. I mentioned earlier with this sense of the, the social contract is changing. That's the kind of reflection of that. OK, let me keep going. So there are many different perspectives on what digital profession looks like. Um, from a health professional perspective, it's usually about, well, you know, whatever whatever house happens, we need to provide healthcare services. And so I will look, I will frown upon anything that compromises my ability to provide care to my patients, to, to the activities I need to do. And so in the, in the interest of keeping everything going, there's often a, a sense of, well, you need to keep digital out of my environment. Um, there are still many examples um, where students are legitimately using a mobile device, for instance, to look up something are now up to date or some other resource and yet they are thought badly or, or, or criticized by their preceptors because it looks like they're they may well be using social media or something else and the patients may may misinterpret that certainly um, learners and uh, our students have this this the dichotomy between their, their confidence which is usually high and their competence which is not usually of a matching uh, uh, height and therefore to what extent are they really making good use of digital media and certainly there are these this sense of generational differences although they, they often tend to be less abrupt than they might seem. Certainly uh, teachers and preceptors are always sending messages about how we use digital media and already some of the examples that you've given reflect that that the medium is the message and how, where, whatever your approach to using digital media is that, that there is an underlying hidden curriculum message that you should be like me. From those who are in charge of training, those who are running universities and those who are running healthcare, it is largely approached from the position of risk management. And you'll probably have seen a lot of um, the way that digital professionalism is articulated is through all the things you should not do. It's almost always cast in, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, this is really bad do this and you'll use your job. The patients, um, the public on the other hand, um, tends to sort of get this sense of this duality between the convenience, because I can do it from my living room and I can do it, I can do it from the loo, which is brilliant. Um, but also does that give me confidence in the healthcare system and do I have confidence in my ability to do that and to be well cared for using this kind of platform. Certainly there are lots of lobby and other groups that are out there who have pursuing their own agendas and ideologies, social media and so on and so on and so on. Lots and lots of other people, including researchers like myself, have perspectives and they don't necessarily all align with each other. So in thinking about how we then portray this, how we move forward education, how how do we move to the point where we're thinking about getting digital professionalism to be part of our landscape? We need to think about how does that then impact the curriculum? And that's, the, that's both the formal curriculum and the hidden curriculum. A lot of the, the language is around, it's around all the things you shouldn't do. This is really, really big and scary. Don't do this. Careful of that. Never do this. That's really bad. Whereas really, I think, Although we do need to be, we need to give a, a strong sense of caution and judicious thinking about when to use these technologies, we also need to be model and leading them. And so, for instance, you know, the, the example that somebody said just now about, well, at the outset of, a, of an online session, we set the rules and we agree them and they may be open to discussion, but, but they are at least understood, set, and then everybody can adhere to them. We should remember that digital professionalism is always linked to professionalism. An act of digital unprofessionalism is unprofessionalism. And so it should be cast in the same light as we teach professionalism in general, which is both formally through, for, through problems to us solving and through our modeling, through all our behaviors that we engage in all the times. Certainly um, problem solving is required because there are new and emerging technologies that are coming out all the time. And certainly the what might work for Facebook may not work for Instagram, because although it's actually very, very similar, I think actually Facebook owns Instagram, certainly one of the big media giants does. Um, there are almost always various differences. There are, there, are, there are subtle differences that actually mean that we have to be careful about them. 
Um, and certainly the way that we talk about um, uh, ethics and professionalism, which is engaged usually about problem solving, does really highlight the way that we can approach this through being able to say, well, what happens when? Let's look at this scenario. Let's look at the situation when. And the reason why we need to do this is because our policy almost always lags practice. And certainly if you think about the policies regarding digital media, they're almost always in, in a position of catch up. And that's policy at the national, at the governmental level, as well as the policies within your institutions and within your programs. And yes, there are generational value shifts. They're, 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 they're more kind of tectonic in the sense they're slow, but they're also tectonic in the sense that they're fairly major. And certainly, certainly the sense of our, the expectation about engaging in a social group through social media has significantly changed from my generation. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in my late 50s now, and I certainly feel like a bit of a, a digital immigrant in this regard. But that's not to say that the, the younger generations need to set the agenda. It just means we all need to be engaged in a common conversation. So we need to think about what we have to preserve and what we allow to change as we move this thing forward. This is an example about how we think thought about the way that this might map to the curriculum and I know I said don't do negatives but you know the, the lower level is all the things you should not do so we start off by saying you know well what should you be doing well you need to be competent you need to be able to use the technologies available to you that you engage with you need to maintain some kind of online prof professional pr presence but you need to be able to maintain it not just in the sense of well it's not out of date but also maintain it in the face of digital attack, because that may well happen. And that, I mean, it may be somebody hacks your website, but it may also be that your reputation is called in online through social media, those kind of things. At least being aware of that's important. Um, and you do need to model positive and effective behaviors to others. And so, and so it's not just as in, well, I mean, I'm not gonna use it at all. Well, okay, that, that, that is a position, but more likely you will have to use it to some extent, but when you do, you do it to the highest professional standards you can maintain. Be mindful of security at all times and confidentiality. Um, it's been argued that the best way to maintain confidentiality is to have no secrets from everybody. If all the information is completely open and public, there is no problem with confidentiality. That's not the world we live in. And for now, we do have a sense that there is a public and a private domain. And as long as that last confidentiality is critical, Really think about every venue you're in, but you need to be professional and respectful. If you are online, if you're engaging in a chat room, you're still a professional there. And particularly if somebody reaches out and says, well, what do you think about my, my situation? And they're essentially soliciting professional advice. You are definitely a professional at those times. And do maintain those boundaries between what is um, private and what is public, particularly when you're engaging with your patients. Don't waste resources by not being ready. Make sure that you can use the technologies available to you. Don't make anything public that you would not be prepared to defend online. That's the standard. If you're not happy about your thing being in front of a disciplinary committee, then don't put it online. Don't do anything on illegal. And I always say, well, I'm not going to break the law. We all break the law to some extent in the sense of, you know, well, here's the, here's the speed limit. I will go two or three miles an hour over the speed limit because I think that's okay. That's illegal. So clearly I'm prepared to break to a very mild amount, but we'd all do it. So we all kind of hover around this. Think about, for instance, the extent to which you will then take a, a, an article published in, in a paywall journal and email it to a friend. That's actually an illegal act. It's not likely they're going to come after you with lawyers, but be mindful that even these mild uh, forms of illegality do also send a message. Certainly treat healthcare data and anything confidential with the same level of respect that you would the people it came from. Treat your data as if it were your patients that the data came from. Don't forget that anything that happens online has the potential to be online forever and don't uh, behave in uh, reckless and ill-considered ways. Hopefully that's all fairly straightforward and uncontentious, but sometimes it does need to be said to be able to get, to get these things across. So let me do another little pause. How does this or any of your other thoughts relate to the way that teaching and learning should be conducted in a digitally professional way? It's lovely, awkward silence. Yeah. Where everybody anybody should want I... to come in there? Rachel, one yeah. thing on my mind is what, oh, sorry, somebody's ready to come in? Where are you Hi, Holly here from School of Pharmacy. Hi. 
Just a quick question. In fact, you know, sometime uh, during the uh, lectures, or I used to do, I uh, used to take videos from YouTube because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, like, like you, you, you know, images uh, are more, have more impact on the students. So I was wondering now with all the digital lectures I will do, can I still do that? Because is there, there are on YouTube or whatever platform uh, on the internet and uh, sometimes they are really, really good. So it's really nice to use them to teach something complicated uh, to the students. So um, now when I'm preparing my new lectures, I'm thinking oh, I'm not sure I can use it because so it can, can be protected even if there is nothing. You know, I try to find if there is some kind of copyright and I could not find it. So I wonder if, for example, this can be a problem. Uh, it'll look at there. Are, that's a complex question um, because there are lots of intersecting and usually misaligned policies and structures. And the key thing is, so for instance, in Ireland, there will be laws around copyright and digital uh, rights. Um, and you will be bound by those. There will be likely to be copyright regulations in your own institution as well, and you're also bound by those. Um, there's a thing called fair use or fair dealing, which is a general legal principle that as long as somebody's not materially disadvantaged by the reuse of their material and, and only a very small part of it is reproduced, then that is generally considered to be acceptable. But I don't know whether that applies in Ireland. I don't know whether that applies to your institution. However, having said that, if if you are not if you're not in any way economically or reputationally um, affecting or impacting a group, as in nobody's losing money because you're doing this thing, or nobody's having their reputation cost, then it's actually quite hard to take that to court and show that um, that was a problem. So, for instance, if you reproduce an entire digital textbook, the publisher can reasonably say, well, clearly you're you're impacting my income. But if you just say, well, here's one small image that I've used from here and give it full attribution for you, very clear where you got it from, that's more defensible. But I would come back to what the standards are in your country. And I can say, for example, in Canada, they're very different from the United States. The United States is very much more liberal. Canada is much more conservative in that regard. And so what I could do south of the border, I can't do north of the border here in Canada. So it's a simple thing, but it's also a complex thing. OK, thanks. Uh, any time for one more comment before I move on? Um, Lena Kadri, you have your mic activated. Have you a question? Oh, sorry, no, I was just having a few technical issues. Sorry okay. about that. Thank That's you. Okay. OK, I'll keep going and there will be some time at the end to sort of come back to that. So. It, and it's not just that um, digital professionalism is something that you know the, the 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 doctors and physicians and physiotherapists and engineers of tomorrow need to do. We are all digital professionals, and that actually, to some extent, you know, really reaches out to some. You, you would almost say, well, that reaches out into the public. Think how many patients come to their healthcare providers. Uh, it used to be a, a you know a handful of printouts. Now maybe it's a, a batch of URLs or things on their phone. But to say. I found this online. I think I have this. I, you know, I, I have this. I, I think I'm haunted, or I'm, I'm full of disease, or whatever it is. Um, the democratization of knowledge certainly has blurred some of those boundaries about where those expectations should be. Being a member of a health professional, as in you are licensed, you are recognised, you are qualified to be a health professional, however, is still an important boundary, um, and. Then a boundary that you are certainly bound to respect and and to consider what those boundaries look like in the way that you interact with your colleagues and other people. And yet your reputation can come under attack. I don't know how often you Google yourself. It, it may feel that it's a rather sort of vain, glorious thing to do. But I would say that as professionals who can be attacked, it is a good idea from time to time, certainly if you're interacting with the public uh, into, as a provider, that you do search for yourself to make sure that your uh, your your reputation hasn't been solid in some way. And I, I would point to, for instance, the Rate My MD site. I don't know how much it's used in Ireland, but certainly it's used in Canada. And it's essentially used by patients to say how much they what they thought of their doctors, like an Amazon five star rating kind of thing. And the key thing about Rate My MD is that 
that is oh, pretty much only used by people who are either really hate their provider or love them a little bit too much. And so there are, you usually only get one star ratings or five star ratings. And so the question is, A, can you trust this? But more importantly, what are these people saying about you? Um, and to what extent are they calling your professional uh, pro reputation into, into possibly disrepute? And what might you be able to do about that? And so you might say, well, I, you know, I'm therefore I'm not going to have any online presence because it's just too risky. You may have one even if it's not, even if you don't want one. If you work for, and you, well, from what I heard, you're all working for, I think, universities and colleges and schools and other organizations. Well, they very likely have information about you online. So you, even then you do have an online presence. So to really, if you didn't have any online presence at all, do you even exist? And certainly there are many, I think, younger people who may wonder, do you exist in any meaningful way if you're not online? So you have to be mindful that digital professionalism applies to you even if you don't have your own personal website or a Twitter account or a public Facebook presence, that you probably still have digital pre pre presence and therefore digital pre 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 professionalism still applies to you. So how do you relate that to your identity as a provider? Now, I'm going to this isn't the example we use in Canada. And I know it's probably not the one you use in Ireland, but this is the one I know because this is one we have here. And this says a, this says a, a Canadian physician has to be competent and proficient in all seven of these areas. They have to be a medical expert, but they also have to do these six intrinsic roles. They have to be a scholar, an advocate, a leader, a collaborator, a communicator, and a professional. And so in this sense, we can link digital professionalism. It's clearly in the in the professional role, but it's also be digital professionalism in the way that you communicate, in the way that you collaborate, in the way that you lead, in the way that you engage in acts of advocacy, and the way you're a scholar, as well as the way that you practice your medical expertise. So let me just take another little step and stop and just see, are there any comments about how does this map to Ireland? What are your professional frameworks and how does digital professionalism map to those? I think, Rachel, it's fair to say that those um, competencies would apply to any profession. You know, teaching profession per se, it doesn't have to be a medical professional, um, just to prompt people from that perspective. Absolutely. And I see we, we use CanMES for our, our own teaching uh, within the medical school here in Calgary, and we apply it to our master's and PhD programs, and it, it maps very well. Yes. Any thoughts, any contributions before I move on? It's a fairly depressing uh, world you're painting, isn't it? Because it just <laughs> it kind of it has a lowest common denominator effect that you just have to be utterly well behaved at all times. Uh, yes, it's, it's more it's more that that you don't have the privacy or the limited access that you necessarily used to have. Um, and so it's more about being cautious. I mean, it's like saying, well, it's a very depressing world if you go driving nowadays because there's so many more cars on the road. But that what you have to do is you just change the standards of your behavior that keeps you safe. In the meantime, you can still do all the things that digital technologies afford you, but you can do them in ways that respect your professional responsibilities and allow you to make the most of the, the opportunities that they give you to do things. So it's more, I think it's more about just a shifting sense of mindfulness and caution, but also being open to the possibilities of things you can do. I certainly don't want you to come away feeling you know, completely bleak at the end of this. OK, let me keep going. So should you be digital or not? Well, you will have a digital presence that, that is done about you by other people like your, your employer and possibly others as well. Um, and so really, you should try to be selective in what you have out there as much as you can and maintain control and maintain what's going on. Um, and so this, this is this sense of, well, OK, well, then what do I do? How do I manage that? Well, you have to be watching what's happening around you. You need to be thinking about what is said about you and whether there is anything you could or should say about it. And it's certainly about being being judicious in when or when not to be um, uh, digital, when, when you're not going to engage in professionalism. And it's like they, it's one of the things that politicians say to each other is assume every mic is an open mic. And it's like that. You can still do all the things you need to do, but you just need to be mindful of the environment you're in. 
Um, I'm not sure how many of you have Alexa or some of these sort of home monitoring technologies. Um, they are very useful in many ways, but they also potentially are a security risk in the sense of you're not entirely sure who's listening or who's recording any of the things you might be saying. And so again, it's not saying you shouldn't use them, just be judicious about how you use them and how you set their settings. And so really it's about knowing when to engage, when not to engage and how to engage, rather than saying, okay, I can't do anything, it's all just too scary. Do you all need to be online? Not necessarily in the sense that you don't need to have a Facebook page and your own personal website and a Twitter account. But whatever you do, it should be a deliberate and defensible decision. And I, 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 I actually deleted my Facebook account recently because I just don't really trust them as an organization anymore. I have a Twitter account. I don't use it very often. And I have a presence through various places, including this recording today. And those are deliberate acts. Um, I, I've tried not to get sweary in this presentation, and that's also part of my dig, uh, digital professionalism. Well, if you are online, you should be able to account what your presence is. You should be able as much as possible control who can see what, set your privacy settings, be ready to respond, respond to attacks. Most of us don't get attacked most of the time, but it's possible. Maintain enough presence, but not necessarily as massive presence unless that's proportional to what you're trying to be able to do. Reflect the role and responsibility and the standards that you aspire to. Um, Take material down permanently if necessary, but also bear in mind that permanently, if it's in the public domain, is probably impossible. And do be professional at all times. So let me put back to you. I mean, I'm coming towards the end of the session. What commitment to change? Actually, no, I think I'll actually I won't stop here, I, I, but I'll just put this to you to think about for in your own uh, space and time. What kind of action plan for changes in your practice might you undertake to better reflect the principles of digital professionalism? And think about the commitment to a change that you might take from this session and think about three things that you might do following the session today. So let me just finish off and then I'll just open up for a few questions at the end. Um, I don't think that digital media are an intrinsic threat. I think it's important that um, that we use them, we use them appropriately. In fact, we use them creatively and effectively to extend our ability to be professional. Um, so you can use it for positive purposes that do support patient care, compassion, altruism and trustworthiness. And we should be aware of the way that digital technologies are shaping our relationships, both with technologies and with each other. And so the way we use digital technology should maintain the capacity to do all the things that we do as professionals. It can allow us to extend them, but we just need to be mindful and cautious and deliberate, i.e. we need to be professional at all times. So thank you for uh, spending some time with me and thinking about these issues today. And Cicely, if we have time, I'm happy to take a few questions. OK, we certainly have some time. First, I want to absolutely thank Rachel for what has been a very thought provoking, demanding. Yes, I, I see the claps coming in there in various formats. And um, this is one of the difficulties of being remote, being present in different places geographically. Uh, Rachel, that was fan fantastic, very thought provoking uh, and I hope very useful for people. I certainly remember you saying that before to check your own profile online, which I did at the time and was very surprised and have not checked it in the intervening time. The second thing I would say is that um, I have made fantastic use of your principles of digital professionalism, i.e. the 2010, um, which were seven principles, and they're introduced to our first years, literally within their first week. And the whole concept of netiquette guidelines has now come um, full center into our new Learning to Learn Online module for our students, um, which of course has been developed over the summer specifically to respond to the current pivot. Um, but if I could get in there first with a little bit of a thought process that's out there, where is the balance between trusting our students, asking them to effectively behave in an ethical manner with the material we're recording for their good at this point in time, and balancing that with the notion of kind of legalistic declarations um, and, and which, of course, is a 
valid thing to do uh, as a slide in every recording saying this must be for your own personal use only etc and the reason I ask that question is in the context of us not wanting to be inhibited in our interactive live online teaching out of fear that in trying to give students examples sometimes to get them to think we have to start from the extreme and move into the center what kind of advice or reaction would you have there? A few things. One is to is to point to the work of one of your own great scholars, Honora O'Neill, um, a, a legal scholar. I think she may even be at Trinity. Um, but uh, Honora O'Neill uh, gave the Reith Lectures about 10 years ago, talking about trust and accountability. And her thesis was, in a modern age, we are increasingly eroding trust and replacing it with accountability. Trust is that I, I, I don't need to know that you're doing the right thing. I just believe that you are. Accountability is I don't trust that you are anymore. I need to see that you're doing the right thing. So I'm going to, you need to tell me and show me and show me and show me. And this is this is in politics, is in the public sphere entirely that we've seen this shift. And so it's not surprisingly surprising then that our ability to trust our learners isn't as high as it might have been. And therefore, we need to see that they're doing what they should be doing. But I see that's part of that broader trend rather than something that's intrinsic to digital media. The other quality I, I, I put probably in here is the way you treat your patients. For those of you who have clinical practice or engage in clinical practice, you know, you advise your patients, you provide care to them, but you're not responsible for them. You know, if, if you if you are responsible for the, the criminal acts or even you know the, the reckless behaviors of your patients, you'd be in pretty deep trouble because they're out there driving too fast, drinking too much, eating too much you know, hitting each other, stealing things, I don't know, I'm not, probably not all of them, but you know, there is a sense that they're doing these misdemeanors, but you're not, you don't necessarily feel responsible because the standards have been set, they are adults, they have to, and they have to A, follow the rules, and if they don't, they're accountable for their misdemeanors. I don't think that should be any different with learners, they're adults. If we treat them like children and say, well, you know, we have to police them and, you know, give them a very controlled environment, no, I don't think that's right. I mean, we should help them to develop those standards. But with the main time is that we can't be as we, we can be no more responsible for the digital than we can be for any of their other acts. And if we're not prepared to police what they do in the pub at night, then why do we worry so much about digital media? OK, thank you. Any questions out there? I'm very happy to ask that the recording be turned off now. If if anyone wants to come in before we do that. Um, Cecily, it's uh, Deirdre. Have you? I don't know if there's anyone else talking. Okay, I've got the floor. Uh, Deirdre Darcy in the School of Pharmacy. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Um, just, I suppose, I don't know. Is it a thought or is it a question? Um, there's a lot of focus on ensuring at the beginning, especially since we've pivoted to online teaching and so on, and ensuring that everyone is, you know, committed to uh, consent to recording a session and so on. And I think that there could be value in, I don't know, is this going one step further or going the opposite direction, that we can also identify sessions where everybody is committed to not recording anything, even if it's online, and that actually everyone signs up to not recording anything so that we can all be a bit more human and not, not unprofessional, obviously, but just, you know, just a little less aware of being recorded and things being around forever online and that we can actually just act a little bit more naturally. I'm wondering what you think of that. I mean, you 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 can never entirely guarantee that somebody hasn't got their phone in the background, or or I mean, it's that thing about digital proctoring for exams. You you, you assume that I'm alone in this room right now. What you can't see is the five thousand people, um, and you know, all armed and you know, carrying drugs and various things that are out of camera. Okay, they're not really there, but the things you don't know. And so, you know, there is that sense that you, we're back to we're going from accountability back to trust. I, if we don't trust each other, I don't know whether we truly have a society anymore. So I think encouraging that sense of trust is important. Uh, you can't prove it, but so you have to trust people. But I can, I, you, but you'll know as an educator that those moments where you know it's like cone of silence time, they're some of the most emotionally and intellectually challenging and important moments in professional development about I need to tell you about the time when this happened to me and it's usually can be quite quite troubling but you can't say it unless you're in that cone of science unless you're in that trust space so I absolutely agree I think if we don't have those spaces 
then our learners are going to bottle things up and they're going to feel that they they can only talk about you know the, the safe topics rather than what are often the most important topics which are not that safe in the healthcare space thanks great anybody else Okay, I'm going to suggest to Jade we can stop the recording in thanking Rachel yeah. very much. Mm -hmm.